uh, later in the book, but I still want to begin at chapter 1. The first four verses, you remember, this is where the Son is, is put out and explained that he's the climax of divine communication. This introduction to what is essentially a written sermon, the first four verses, he, he tells us about Jesus as the, the climax of divine communication, and he makes these powerful assertions about the person, work, and status of the Son. And then in verses 5 through 14 of chapter 1, he stresses that the Son is superior to the angels. And given that superiority, he says in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, that they, and mean they, and of course then we, are to pay greater attention to what they've, what they've heard, <clears throat> pay greater attention than they have been paying to what they've heard uh, because of the greatness of Christ and his superiority. Pay greater attention to the words spoken through the Son, the message of salvation, and the danger of not doing that, the danger of becoming lax in that regard is that they may drift away. And I've talked about that a number of times, how that operates. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, <clears throat> it resumes the exposition on Christ that was interrupted, so to speak, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, where he, he interjects that exhortation, and then he picks back up in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, with the exposition on Christ. In those verses, they serve as a transition to the discussion in chapter 2, verses 10 through 18, about the Son's solidarity with humanity. And okay, in 2, 5 through 9, he explains that the superior Son for a time became lower than the angels. And then in chapter 2, 10 through 18, we see that the Son became lower than the angels. The, the Son, who was, he was made lower than the angels, he became a human subject to human authority. That's this idea that for a while, he was made lower than the angels. He did that to nullify the devil's work. He became a human being to conquer human mortality, to conquer death by providing through his sacrifice resurrection life for the children of God and as a result to free them fully from the fear of death. See, Jesus defeated death in his crucifixion and resurrection and we will see the full effects of that victory in the resurrection that will take place at his return. So, it's, you know, people have analogized this idea to, you know, like, like in World War II, you had... Uh, you know, the great, uh, the invasion of Normandy, D-Day, and that was it, that was the victory. It's, uh, everything else is just mopping up after that, so we have the victory that is won, and we wait the full effects of that, the fruits of that, in the resurrection at Christ's coming. And in verses uh, 2, 17, and 18, this leads into the central section of the book. Central section of the book is chapter 4, verses 14, through chapter 10, verse 25, that focuses on the high priesthood of Jesus. Now, even in that section, there's going to be one of these uh, hortatory interjections from 5.11 to 6.20. But the main section of the book, 4.14 to 10.25, it's talking and focusing on the high priesthood of Jesus. And we see in uh, 17 and 18, they lead into that. You can see from 2.17 and 18 to 4.14 and down, you see the connections and words and things there. But before he gets to that, we're going to have one of these interjections of exhortation that begins in chapter 3 verse 1 and goes through chapter 4 verse 13 and that's what we were looking at last week. We're in this fairly lengthy section where he is exhorting them and as I says it's not unusual at all for a preacher right when you're talking and you're developing things then you stop and you go ahead and, and urge people to a course of conduct. You urge them to do something and that's what he's doing in this section at least as I, as I understand it. In chapter 3, where this new uh, section of exhortation begins, verses 1 through 6, Jesus is presented as the supreme example of a faithful son, one who's considered worthy of much greater glory than Moses. We talked about that last week. He says in verse 6 that he and his readers, not the Jews, okay, the writer and his readers, not the Jews, are the new covenant people of God, but the continuance of that privilege depends on their not surrendering their faith under the pressure they were facing. You remember the, the, the setting that I spent some time talking about? We have here Christians. Uh, I'm looking at them as being uh, Christians who are probably in Rome, but they are uh, you know, a subset of the church there, maybe uh, one or more house churches that are predominantly Jewish. They're being tempted to return to some kind of Judaism. And I tried to lay out for you in that story that Guthrie tells that, you know, uh, you can see how that would happen, how somebody's being pressured, maybe somebody who's poor, life isn't that great, he's being pressured to return to the 
uh, customs and things that, that he grew up with. He's being shunned by his family, being shunned by his tradition. Those folks, maybe there's also this rising sense of persecution as Nero, if we're in the mid-60s and we've got Nero here, we're on the verge of the outbreak of the Neronian persecution that was quite severe in Rome. And so, you know, somebody's saying, well, wait a minute, you know, Jews are recognized as a protected religion. Christians are not. Uh, so you, you can see this, this tendency, this temptation to want to go back and be safe. And he's addressing that. And part of the reason, you know, I think Hebrews is, is so uh, relevant is we're always talking about how do we close the back door? What do you do with people who are drifting away? What do we do with young people? They seem to be being pulled away by the culture. Well, here we have a book where, that is written that is addressing precisely that kind of thing. People who, for whatever reason, are being tempted to abandon Christ and go back to another way. And so I think it's relevant. And he says here in, in chapter 3, verse 6, the, the continuance of the privilege depends on their not surrendering their faith under the pressure they're facing. Then in chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, we're given a negative example of those who fell through faithlessness. And I was talking about that last week, and that's where I want to pick back up. Uh, I said uh, some on here, I'll just uh, repeat that, and then we'll, we'll carry on from uh, verse 12. But in chapter 3, verse 7 through 11, he says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in accordance with the day of, of the testing in the wilderness where your fathers tried me with a test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said they are always going astray in the heart and they did not know my ways as I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. And here we, he says that given the need, as he just mentioned in chapter 3, verse 6, the need to hold fast to their confession of faith, he urges them to heed what the Holy Spirit is saying to them through Psalm 95. The, the Spirit is speaking to them through that psalm, and he's telling them, listen, you, you are not to harden your hearts. Okay? Not to harden your hearts as, as the Israelites did when they rebelled against God in the wilderness. And here we have Christians who are being, you know, he, he goes back and, and pulls from the Old Testament. He pulls from the example of the Israelites and tells them. He says, you see what happened to them. You're not to be that way. He's speaking to you through these scriptures. They must not harden their hearts as, as the Israelites did when they rebelled. God was angry with that generation. He said that they would not enter into his rest, which here is a reference to the rest from their enemies that God had promised he would give them in Canaan. Okay, there are a number of scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about that. He would give them rest from their enemies. And this promise of rest in Canaan ultimately is fulfilled in God's eternal consummated kingdom. That is the supreme rest. That is the ultimate rest. Okay, in which all other rest, they are a depiction of it. They point to it. That is the paramount rest. But here in the, in the psalm, he's talking about the rest that he would give them when they were in Canaan. And then in chapter, chapter 3, verse 12. Watch out, brothers. Lest there will be in some of you an evil, unbelieving heart resulting in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another every day so long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become sharers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence firm till the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who rebelled? For who rebelled after hearing? Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt through Moses? And with whom were they angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? And we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So he tells them, he warns them to watch out. Watch out lest some of them have an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. <clears throat> and he admonishes them to encourage one another daily so that none of them may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, sin has, a de has an attractive deceptiveness, okay? Or, or it has a, a, a deceptive attractiveness to it. You know that. I mean, you know, we live in this world, okay? It has, it has this lure to it, this deceptive attractiveness that makes one resistant to the Word of God. The more it lures, the less one is willing to hear what God wants. I was thinking this morning, it's almost like a, uh, you know, and, and some kind of attacking bacteria or something that seeks to dull your immune defenses. 
The more we are lured by sin, the less one is willing to hear what God wants. Here, you see the sin of compromise and unfaithfulness. It held the promise of what? Of making life easier. That, I mean, right? I mean, that's, that's what's pulling them. They say, listen, if I would, would compromise, if I would not be faithful to my confession of Christ, well, then I have the potential then of, you know, being, having my family say, okay, welcome back to the fold. You've kind of turned loose of this crazy Jesus stuff. I have the possibility of maybe avoiding some of this persecution that is in the wind, in the air. And so you see how these things pull. Now, we have other things pulling us, but you can see that there, that there is this pull. And, and when that happens, it's as though we say, okay, we then become dead to the word of God. Okay, as the more, the, the more we're lured, the less we're willing to hear it. And in an active fellowship, you see, a fellowship that is working, a body of Christ that is functioning the way it's supposed to, the clouded vision that sin induces is challenged. You see, as we get lured by sin, we are less open to what God wants us to do, but in an active fellowship, that clouded vision that sin induces gets challenged by brothers and sisters in Christ so we can see more clearly. You see, that's how the body of Christ is to function. It is not simply a social group where we are isolated from one another. There is this idea, see, of, of helping one another in this struggle of sin, of helping, you know, when sin clouds our vision. These people here are being pulled. They're thinking, no, this isn't that important. Jesus, yes, I understood that at one point, but boy, this really looks attractive over here. And we need as brothers and sisters in Christ to tell our brother and sister who's being pulled that their vision has been clouded. They're not thinking clearly. They're not seeing correctly. And we need to help them. And that's what he's talking about here when he speaks about, you know, this idea of, of fellowship, encouraging one another as long as it's called today. Encourage one another. Help one another to see things clearly. Help one another to stay on the course. That is what we do sisters in Christ. You see, we have to be willing to do that. And some people don't like that. I understand that. But you can't allow that because some people don't like that. If you say, well, there are people that don't like that, it changes people off. Well, well, see, then you're allowing the people who are wrongly in, you know, sensitive to something, you're allowing them to dictate how the body will function. The body has to do what it's called to do. It has to be a community that, that helps one another in the right understanding of these things, challenges one another. So here, somebody being hardened by sin's deceitfulness, encourage one another daily. Help them to break through that cloud in perception that sin induces because it will harden somebody to the word of God. That's how it operates. That's how sin operates. And it, the fellowship needs to help Help us to break through that. He says they're to encourage one another as long as it is called today because the psalm says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now there will be a time when a right relationship with God will have passed, the time for having, the time for that opportunity for a right relationship with God will have passed, a time that's marked by the Lord's return. And at that time, there will no longer be need for encouragement against sin because the race will have been run. But as long as it's called today, we need to be involved with each other. We need to be helping each other, talking to one another, acting as a live body that works together rather than as discrete, isolated particles that are simply in proximity to one another. That's not how a body functions. A body is living and operates together. And so here you see a, a critical aspect of that. And I think people, you know, there are no, some people who are put off by it, but I think there are many people who long for that in the church. See, who long for a fellowship that will help bless one another spiritually by helping to keep the hardness of sin, to keep that misperception away. Now, it's crucial that they not become resistant to God's word through the hardening induced by sin because they and we must remain faithful till the end. That's why it's so important, because sin can pull you away. It can harden you. It's a, you know, it's a jungle out there. 
It is a jungle out there, and sin can pull you away. And the reason it's so important is that we, we not become resistant to the word because of this hardening by sin is because we have to remain faithful to the end. The consequence of the Israelites' failure to remain faithful, the consequence of their refusal to continue trusting in God and his promises was that they didn't enter the promised land. Right? That's what happened to them. There is this land, this rest, this glory that's waiting for them, that's promised to them, and what happened because they weren't faithful? They were pulled away. What happened? They didn't enter. And that's why he's telling. Now, the context, remember, is there are people who are being pulled and tempted. Are there people like that today? Yes. And what do we tell them? We have to tell them this. But we don't like telling them this. We think that if you warn people and you tell them this kind of thing, that that sounds legalistic and mean. Well, we don't want them thinking that God's that way. Well, what's, what, what way is he? Yeah. But we want, we want to kind of, you know, we want to, we want to be God's public relations man. And we want to make sure that, you know, no, they don't. They, it's all that. He warns them they're in danger of drifting away, and there's no apology necessary for that. Okay? Is God a God? Of course God is a God of love. That's why he's issuing these warnings. This is loving to do warn somebody who's in danger of abandoning the faith because they will lose the promised land as surely as the Israelites did. And so, again, who loves somebody? Isn't it the person who says what this preacher says? Okay, yeah. Yeah, and so well, we don't like saying this kind of thing, and we have people who are in danger. We have to tell them. We have to tell them. Now, that doesn't mean we sit here and go to people and say, you know, I'm really happy that you're, you're, you're going away. It's not that. It is this, this idea, this warning that, listen, uh, the Israelites drifted and were, fell short of the promised land. The same will happen to his readers if they abandon their confession of faith. The same will happen to us. And, you know, this is a long journey. Brother John and I often joke that it's a long run to the grave, you know. And it, it, Christianity is dull trench warfare. Day in, day out, all of your life. Faithfulness, all of your life. And you need people to help you and to encourage you in that long, you know, you have periods of time where you're up, down, this kind of thing. We need the encouragement. We need the encouragement because this idea of drifting away, and we see it in our churches. And we have to tell people, listen, this, this is serious, serious business. Okay, then in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, let us fear... Lest while a promise to enter into his rest is remaining, any of you should be found to have fallen short. For indeed, we have had the gospel preached to us, just as they also. But the word of preaching did not benefit those people because they were not united by faith with those who listened, those who heeded, okay, those who took to heart. Now, given the example of the fallen Israelites, they need to fear God. See, to fear the consequences of rejecting his will. We had somebody here a couple month ago or whenever when David Hamilton was here and he did a lesson on fearing God, about the benefits of fearing God. And we need to fear God to fear the consequences of rejecting his will, lest the lack of such fear leads some of them to fall short of entering into the promised rest, the ultimate manifestation of which is eternal glory with God. So that's why we need to fear him. If we just sit here and treat him cavalierly and just say, you know, I don't, so what if I reject God's will? So what? If we do that, if that is our approach, then we are in danger of drifting away, okay, of being hardened and therefore of falling short of what is promised. George Guthrie, he writes in his commentary, he says, therefore the rest is something a believer enters and thus experiences now but this rest remains a promised destination for the future. See, it's another example of the fact what is a basic feature of New Testament theology. To quote Guthrie again, Christian realities have been inaugurated but have yet to be consummated. See, this is this idea of inaugurated eschatology, the notion that the not yet has broken into the now, and we experience this now in some fashion and foretaste, but we await its ultimate fulfillment. And you can see that in this sense of rest. Rest is something in which we enter into now, but there is an ultimate fulfillment of it, okay, that awaits a future date and the return of Christ. 
He says, as, as with the Israelites, the mere fact the gospel, the good news of deliverance into rest was preached to them, it will not benefit them. See, it will not benefit them unless they're among those who have surrendered to that gospel, who are trusting in that divine revelation. What happened? The Jews had the good news of deliverance into rest, into Canaan, delivered, given to them. But what happened? It didn't benefit them. It did not benefit them because they were not among those who listened, who heeded. Where are their bodies are all over the desert. And he just sits here and says, listen, there's an example here. And so he's talking to people who are tempted to turn away, tempted to go, and he's telling them, don't do that. Because the consequences of doing that are, you will miss the promised land. You will miss it. Okay? Uh, and that, I mean, to me, this is an important thing, an important thing that, uh, that we have to urge on people and have to get them to recognize and to see. All right, chapter 4, verse 3. He says, for we, the ones who have believed, enter into the rest, just as he said, as I swore in my anger, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has said about the seventh day the following, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place it says, they shall not enter into my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter into it, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not enter because of disobedience. Now, I'm stopping here at verse 6. It's from 3 to 11. I want to stop here at verse 6, and let me say something about, uh, about these verses. See, those who believe the gospel of Christ enter into God's rest with all that that entails for the future. Okay, it's this idea, do we enter? We enter into his rest, but there is a future aspect, a fuller sense of that. Okay, this idea of the now and the not yet. So those who believed enter into God's rest and all that that entails for the future and the fact there's an ongoing opportunity to enter that rest. That's what he's trying to get across to him. The fact there's an ongoing opportunity to enter that rest is evident from the fact that God long ago rested on the seventh day after creation. Okay, he rested on the seventh day but denied some of the Israelites long after he'd rested. Okay, he rests on the seventh day. Long after he'd done that, he denied some of the Israelites the privilege of entering his rest because of their disobedience. The rest was available for them to enter, right? They could have if they had been faithful. So the rest remained open for them to enter, even though God rested on the seventh day. So he wants them to see this notion of the ongoing aspect of God's rest. It is not something that is closed, not something that ended, it is ongoing, and he gets them to see that by saying, listen, the ongoing nature of that rest is evident from the fact that those who were the Israelites could have entered into his rest but for disobedience. So it was there for the taking if they had been faithful. Now, I want to say something about this notion of God's rest. Okay, this, this is kind of a footnote. This is an aside, but I, I think it's worth mentioning. God rested on the seventh day, see, in the sense that he abstained or ceased from the work of creation that was completed on day six. Okay, let me read to you a quote that, uh, from Alan Ross, who's an Old Testament scholar. He says, the word actually means cease more than rest as understood today. It's not a word that refers to remedying exhaustion after a tiring week of work. Rather, it describes the enjoyment of accomplishment, the celebration of completion. I say that because sometimes I get this idea that we talk about God rested as though he was winded or something. Yeah, yeah you know, he's really working hard and then he just, ah, oh, that's not what he's talking about. That is, a, to me, a, a very strange idea of God. That he just gets beat and he needs to take a sushi. And, you know, he needs, to, that's right, a Chinese word, although I butchered it, a word for a rest or a nap or something like that. You see, that, that's not what this is about. That's not the sense in which he's talking about. Now, also note that, that what probably is blessed and sanctified in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, is not simply the seventh day as a day of the week. Okay, not, not simply that, but the seventh day is a representation of God's rest. Okay, as the goal toward which creation moves. It's bigger than, it, it, there's something else going on there. It's a sign pointing to the ultimate rest of the people of God. Okay, let me read to you what uh, a fellow named uh, Andrew Lincoln says. I just like this. It's a couple of slides, but maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't. 
But I did, and I teach, so I get to present it. So here we go. He says, he says here, the climax of God's creative activity is not the creation of male and female so much as his own triumphant rest. It's true that his blessing and hallowing of the seventh day are not meant to be considered simply in a vacuum, but have some relation to the created world. What is crucial, however, is the nature of that relation. The seventh day is to be seen as representing the completion of the whole creation, and therefore in its blessing the whole creation is blessed. Creation, therefore, is blessed with special reference to its goal, God's rest, which is set apart in some sense for all his creation, including man and woman, but the precise sense awaits further unfolding. The framework of Genesis 1 and 2 certainly indicates that there is a, divide, a divine ordering of history so that as history moves toward its, toward its consummation, it moves toward the goal of God's rest. And see, this fits with how the Hebrew writer is talking. There is this idea, see this rest, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a second. But uh, I just like that. Now I'm going to go back to... Back to where we were. <clears throat> Let me read this, and I want to read this again. Not, I want to talk about verses 7 through 11, and if I just popped in on those without reading this again, I think it would just uh, be a little harder to follow. So let me run through this, and then I'll hit the next slide. He says, For we, the ones who have believed, enter into the rest, just as he said, As I swore in my anger, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has said about the seventh day the following, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place it says, they shall not enter into my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter into it, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not enter because of disobedience, again he sets a certain day, today, saying by David, after so much time, as it, saying by David after so much time, as it has already been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua gave them rest, he would not have spoken after these things about another day. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who entered into his rest has himself also rested from his works, just as God rested from his own works. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter into that rest, lest someone may fall by following the same example of disobedience. See, that opportunity to enter God's rest that he talked about that showed that it didn't end when God rested on the seventh day of creation, but you could see that it was still available at the conquest, or when he, when he brought them out, it was still available. It was there for the taking. It hadn't, it hadn't expired. The reason they didn't take it was because of their disobedience. But that opportunity to enter his rest continued beyond the conquest of Canaan. Okay, as evident by the fact that David, long after that, Right? Okay, we come out of Egypt, then we have the conquest, and long after that we have David saying, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The implication being that they could enter God's rest by not following the Israelites' example of disobedience in the wilderness. So this promise of God's rest is still open. It still remains, okay? That's, been, that's why you get the conclusion in verse 9, he says, So there remains a rest for the people of God. Okay, it is not something, the door's not closed, it's not over, there remains a rest for the people of God. It's not something past, it's not a promise that has been exhausted, it's something that remains for them and for us. Okay, this idea, the God's rest is open. Now the Sabbath rest that remains for the people of God refers ultimately, ultimately to life in the eternal state. And we will at that time rest from our works in that the struggle of existence in this fallen, sin-corrupt world will have ceased, right? This is a world of what? Of thorns and thistles. This is a world of increased labor and burden. Why? Because it's a fallen world. Look around. Look around at the suffering, the hardship, the struggle. There is a time coming when we will rest from that. Okay, we will rest from that, and that's what he's talking about when he says we will rest in a manner that's similar to God's resting. See, life in that state will further parallel, we, we will rest and we'll have that, and we'll also be glorifying and praising God, so further parallel Sabbath observance. Okay, so there's this idea that we will at that time rest from our works, and that that struggle for existence in this fallen, sin-corrupted reality will be over. 
And then given the blessedness of that rest, he says he urges them, and of course then urges us, to be diligent, see, to exert serious effort. Can't be blasé about it. Can't be just sitting there saying, you know what, I just kind of bop in, do the minimum, punch the card. You can't do that. Because there's a war going on. There is a spiritual war going on. And if you're just bopping around and unaware of it and not diligent, what's going to happen? You may think you're going to be okay. I'll stand, I'll stand, who cares? I don't have to put any energy or effort into it. And he says, you will be bagged. You will be bagged because there is a spiritual war and the enemy who is after you is not stupid. Not stupid. Really, really clever. You see? And so he's, he's warning them, urging them that we have to go ahead and put effort into this. Given the blessedness of that rest, we have to put diligent, serious effort into it so that none of them miss the rest by following the Israelites' example of disobedience. That's verse 11 where he says, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest someone may fall by following the same example of disobedience. So he's telling them, listen, you have to really apply yourself. Otherwise, you may be one like one of these Israelites. What happened? They had the gospel preached to them. They had the gospel of deliverance into rest. And what happened? Well, look at the desert. It's full of bodies. And he says, you have to be diligent or you too will miss the promised rest. And so it's a message for the church, isn't it? Isn't it a message when we talk about, as I say, you know, closing the back door and this kind of thing? Now, I can't make somebody heed these words. You know, that's not how God has set it up. But I can tell people these words. I can say this to them. And it's up to them whether they will heed it. You know, I always like that, uh, the way God works, I always like that example of Jim McGuigan, where he says, you know, God's bigger than you are. He could certainly force you to do anything he wanted. You know, he could boom out in this big voice and say, people, this is God. For the next 30 seconds, there will be no air. Well, you don't know, you know, think he could just beat you into doing whatever? He could. But he doesn't choose to do that. He chooses to have you come and choose. And so that's why I say, I, I can say these words. I can say these words, but I have nothing. I can, I can make somebody heed them. But I think we do them a disservice if we do not say these words. Because the Hebrew writer says them to people who are in danger of drifting. And that seems good enough for me. That we need to go ahead and say that. All right, in 12 and 13, he says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than every double-edged sword and penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is not a creature hidden before him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom our account is given. Okay? They have to be diligent in maintaining their faithfulness because the word of God demonstrates. It demonstrates that nothing is hidden from God. It shows his awareness of the inner recesses and darkest corners of the human heart. Read the Bible and you will see that God knows. It is his word and he is telling you it reaches into the deepest, darkest crevices anywhere. It will convict you and that says God knows what's going on. So the word of God, its penetration into your heart and being is testimony of the fact the one who wrote it knows all about you. You see, your life is laid bare before God. You can't get over on God. You can't fake God out. You can't pretend to be faithful and not be. And so it, it raises the stakes in the seriousness of being faithful. He's telling them you have to be faithful. You have to be diligent in this. And you have to be diligent in it because if you're not, you will not enter into the promised land. And you can't fake God out. Because he sees everything. He sees who you are. He knows the inner you. He knows how you live when you're away from the building. That's what I talked about uh, some weeks ago, and maybe last week. I don't know. I don't remember. But, uh, you know, he knows. And so that's what I think he's talking about here with this. See, everything is laid bare before the eyes of, 
of Him before whom we must give account. And since faithlessness and lack of trust in God's promises cannot be hidden, they must exercise diligence so as not to drift into that state of faithlessness. Effort, diligence, you know, exerting ourselves, spending some energy. We have to do it. And he urges them to do that. Then in verses 14 through 16, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, having been tempted in every way in likeness to us, was without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and may find grace for timely help. Now, George Guthrie, who's uh, outlined, I'm following, uh, Guthrie, he, he labels these verses as an overlapping transition because they serve as a conclusion. Remember, he has this in 2.17 and 18. He's introducing the main section from 4.14 to 10.25, but 3.1 through 4.13, you get this, uh, this interjection of exhortation. Okay, well, that's just ended, but these verses here, they serve as a, as a conclusion of that exhortation, and they serve as the opening for this great central exposition of the high priesthood of Christ. So that's why he labels it that way. And in the, these first, uh, in verses 14 and 15, you see this, uh, another exhortation to hold firmly to the faith because Christians have a great high priest. Because we have a great high priest who, who in his ascension passed through the impermanent physical heavens. I think this is neat. You see the ascension when they're out there watching and he passes through these impermanent physical heavens into heaven itself. Okay, meaning the realm of God's immediate and special presence. Jesus is there. Whatever, and I think of this in terms of dimensions. And so does N.T. Wright. I think of this in terms of dimensions. And people say, well, how, you know, where is the place? How could it be near and far and this kind of thing? You say, listen, if I had some guy with a Ph.D. in physics come out here and talk to you about, you know, 12 and 13 dimensions, and that there's a dimension that is here and yet not here, what would you, oh, you say, that's deep. Well, the Bible's telling you that. Hey, this is this dimension. That's how I think of it. It's the heavenly realm. Okay, so he sits here and he says that Jesus, we have a great high priest who passed through the impermanent physical heavens into heaven itself, into the realm of God's immediate and special presence. We must hold firmly to our confession of faith because of that. Look at, look at our high priest. Look at Jesus, who he is. Well, who are they going to go to? Somebody who's tempted in our, in our society to go back to what? Back to the world? What does that have to offer when compared to how he's just described Jesus? He's the one who's ascended into heaven itself. And so we have to hold on to this confession of faith. And if we do, if we don't do that, see, we will not have the benefit of his work. So here's the great high priest who has gone into heaven itself. And if we don't hold to him, we won't benefit from it. He won't be ours. Well, isn't that a, that's an important thing for people to know. They have to be told that. Now, David De Silva, in the, in the dictionary of the later New Testament, let me give you another thing that I happen to like. He says, the author of Hebrews uses the term heaven to refer to two different realities in his cosmos. There are the heavens that are part of the changing temporary creation. Hebrews also speaks of heaven itself, the place that Jesus entered after he passed through the heavens, and from which vantage points he point he stands exalted above the heavens. This is the eternal and abiding realm beyond the material and visible creation where Jesus serves as high priest in the greater and perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. The impermanent heavens are what Jesus must pass through in order to get to the true and real tabernacle. See, so this is this picture of Craig Coaster. He says, Jesus passes through the heavens like a priest moving through the forecourt of a sanctuary and into the Holy of Holies. I just think that's neat. You know, you see this imagery of Jesus ascending, passing through the heavens, and entering heaven itself where he serves as a priest on behalf of those who are his. So who are you going to turn to? You know, to whom shall we go? Look who he is. 
this absolutely mind-boggling, marvelous high priest. Okay, and he sits here, same slide I had before, I just wanted you to be able to look at it. We must hold to that confession. See, we have to hold to that because if we don't, we won't have the benefit of his work. If we turn from our confession, turn from faithfulness in Christ, say, listen, you know, it was nice knowing you and all that stuff, but I think I really need to come over here and be part of the world or be part of my Jewish family. If we do that, we won't have the benefit of his work, but we have to hold to that confession for the additional reason that Jesus is a great high priest who, because of his experience of temptation, okay, because of that experience, he has compassion toward us in our state of weakness regarding sin. He is an exceptional high priest, an amazing high priest. Through his identification with us, he's supremely motivated in his ministry on our behalf. Why would you turn from him? Why would you ever turn from him? He identifies with us in a great way. Though he was tempted, the writer says expressly that he was without sin. Okay, never forget that. He's perfect. He was without sin. But this raises a question. Since he's God incarnate, this is just a footnote, because I know how people think about things when you say stuff. But here is it. He's God incarnate. So there's a question of how his being tempted fits with James chapter 1, verse 13, which says God cannot be tempted. Okay, you say, wait a minute, Jesus is God, Jesus is tempted, God cannot be tempted, what's going on? And the answer seems to lie in the mystery of the incarnation. Okay, the fact that Jesus is both God and man, two natures joined together, distinct, but one being, one person, Jesus. Okay, so there's something going on in this aspect. He has two natures that though they're separate, they're united in one person, and the temptation involved somehow is human nature. Okay, so that seems to be the way. Now, when you get into these things, you know, this stuff just gets deep. You know, the incarnation is something. I have a quote I've, I've used before from uh, Wayne Grudem, I think it is. It just says, basically, that, you know, the incarnation is like the most mind-blowing thing ever. That's the gist of it, my words. But it's absolutely mind-blowing that the eternal God, the Son, became the God-man Jesus. Amen. All right, and that's something. Okay, so you have this, but I think that's, that's where something, uh, the answer to this lies somewhere in that. Okay, you're fortunate. That's the second bell. Thanks. <laughs>